So today I'm going to be talking about Charles Rudolph Hadley. Here's a good photo of him. So, welcome to the Black Archive Safer at Home virtual series. My name is Lewis Berthen. I am the assistant archivist. And today we're going to be doing my segment, which is called Legacies, Profiles, and Greatness. And like I said, I'm going to be covering Charles Rudolph Hadley. Here's a photo. And let's get started. So many people knew Charles as Uncle Charlie. He was an immediately recognizable figure at any political gathering. He was five foot seven, 250 pounds, and always wearing his trademark suspenders. His life was dedicated to, an out, to outstanding community service, and he served in the interest of the health of his community and as a political leader. He took part and decided the outcomes of various elections across three decades. So Charles was born on January 8th of 1914 in Cairo, Georgia. He was the fourth of 11 children. His father was a farmer. His mother wanted her children to be educated. And at the time, quality education was not able, was not done for little black children in Georgia. So she sent Charles along with some of his siblings to live with other relatives so that they could participate in school. An uncle in Tallahassee actually took him in, who was also a farmer. So even though he moved to be able to attend school, sometimes things happen and Charles had to drop out of school at various points to be able to work and help provide. However, sometimes these kinds of things are blessings in disguise because while he was working at an ice plant, he actually met a young attorney named Claude Pepper. Hadley and Pepper developed a friendship through their interest in politics, which would continue for the next 40 years. They would go on to help each other through various facets of each other's lives. So Charles didn't actually graduate from high school until 1936 when he was 23 years old. So after graduating, Charles had expressed an interest in getting a degree and Pepper helped him enroll at the Florida Agriculture Mechanical College. So he attended FAMC where he, was, uh, where he met his soon to be wife, Ella Douglas, and he graduated FAMC in 1940 and proceeded to marry Ella in 1941. After this, he moved to Miami in 1943 where he began his career with the Florida State Board of Health. And just for side note, uh, Florida Agriculture Mechanical College did not become FAMU until 1953. So here in Miami, he served for 39 years as a VD investigator for special health services. So essentially what he did was that he worked as a disease intervention specialist. When he started at the department, there was 41 syphilis deaths in a population of 272,116 people. And by 1982, when he retired, there was two deaths in a population of 1,739,000 people. So all in all, very successful career with the Board of Health. But what he's really remembered for is his political activism and participation in politics. And for those who just joined in, I'm talking about Charles Rudolph Hadley, otherwise known as, Char uh, as Uncle Charlie. So... Charles was responsible for what became one of the largest black political machines in South Florida. It was called Operation Big Vote, and it was responsible for voter registration and vote gathering. For more than 25 years, he led registration drives, door-to-door -door campaigns, and get-out-the-vote efforts in Dade County. This, in a lot of ways, resembles what we call today grassroots organizing, which has been used by some very successful political campaigns. So just for extra context, let me give you some voting rights history from Miami-Dade County. In 1920, registered white voters outnumbered black voters 14 to 1, even though one-fourth of the population was black. If you wanted to vote, you needed to pay a biannual poll tax of $1. And prior to 1946, blacks were actually not allowed to vote in Democratic primaries. With all that in mind, blacks also had to contend with segregation and the brutality of the white citizens and police of Dade County. In 1899, a white sheriff named R.J. Chillingworth blatantly stopped blacks from voting to the point where some white citizens actually came out and protested against him and his intimidation tactics. In 1939, there was a Klan rally in Miami that was put together explicitly to scare blacks from voting. Okay, and I'm going to read to you an excerpt from a newspaper where they cover that. Uh, real quick, I want to go back and say, so R.J. Chillingworth was a police sheriff at the time. And in 1899, he was doing this to scare blacks from voting. Remember that Miami as a city would not have been incorporated if it was not for the black citizens who were here. They vote, they, one, more than one third of the actual incorporation document is signed by black men. 
So Miami, as we know, wouldn't exist without the black community. So I'm going to read to you from the Miami Herald. So this was in 1930, May 3rd, 1939. The park rally, last of the primary campaign, was attended by more than 2,000 persons. It was followed by a Klan parade and a lighting of more than 25 fiery crosses. Hundreds of red-lettered warning cards were spread through Miami's Negro section Monday night as the Ku Klux Klan staged an automobile protest against Negro voters in today's primary election. The crosses carried on a huge truck at the head of a parade of about 75 cars bearing uniformed and hooded men were dropped at one block intervals. A dummy dressed to represent a Negro was suspended in a noose from a power pole. On the front of the figure, large red lettered sign read, this and word voted. The hooded occupants of one automobile dangled a hangman's noose from the window of the car. Warning cards were thrown from the windows read, respectable Negro citizens are not voting tomorrow, N word keep away from the polls. The warnings were signed in inch high letters, KKK. So, the good news is, is that, that can, the Klan campaign backfired and several black leaders, along with John Comer, actually reacted by telling the Miami officials that they were going to challenge the Klan and actually go to the polls. And that primary, what, nearly 1,000 blacks voted. So, it was a, so, you know, they challenged that and it's great to see it. So, again, for the people who just joined in, I'm talking about Charles Rudolph Hadley. He was known as Uncle Charlie. And I was talking about Operation Big Vote, which became one of the largest black political machines in South Florida. So that was an excerpt from the Miami Herald on a Klan rally in 1939, which was really not that long ago. And again, we read the success of what happened there. So going back to Operation Big Vote and other efforts like Crusade for Voters, by the 1960s, they had successfully registered 65,000 black voters to the voter rolls. So in a span of 20 years, they had greatly increased the political power of blacks in their community and gave them the power to have a say in this community. So Charles Hadley's first foray into national politics was actually with Congressman Claude Pepper. In his first Senate attempt, Pepper and Hadley had been friends and Pepper was the beneficiary of Hadley's ability to mobilize blocks of voters. Governor Reuben Askew, Congresswoman Carrie Meek, and Miami Mayor Maurice Fair all owe their elections in some parts of the work that Hadley did. He also served as a mentor to other local leaders like M. Athley Range, T. Willard Fair, and Howard Gary, his nephew and the first black to hold the Miami City Manager position. In 1959, Hadley was elected as the unofficial mayor of Black Miami through a postcard poll. Though it was an unofficial position, he tirelessly worked for the people and he, lo and he lobbied vigorously for the improved housing and health care access for Black Miami. In addition to this mayoral position, he served as a member of the Miami Housing Authority, City of Miami Civil Service Board, the Economic Opportunity Program, and the Advisory Board to Metro Dade's Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I can continue telling you about the things that he did, but I'm actually just going to read some newspaper testimonials of his, of his effectualness as a leader. And for those who just joined, again, hi, Ms. Brainin, Mr. Brainin, talking about Charles Rudolph Hadley. So I'm going to read you some newspapers. So there was, uh, in the 70s, there was a big, uh, there was a bond vote that was basically a sweeping redevelopment of downtown Miami. And this was done in tandem. This was done with the work of Charles Hadley and it was done with attorney William Colson. So I'm gonna be reading to you from a newspaper that they were talking to William Colson about Hadley. To organize that effort, he heeded the recommendation of city commissioner, Mrs. Athley Range and recruited Charles Hadley, whose operation Big Vote he credits as a central factor in victory for most of the bond issues. Mr. Hadley didn't convince easily. He wanted to be sure that the fruits for his community were worth the harvesting. The black vote Mr. Colson found is not for sale and could be and could be negotiated for only the sincere conviction that the bond money would be well spent. Big vote enlisted people who knew what they were doing. Under Mr. Hadley's directions, thousands of telephone calls were made, literature was mailed out, volunteers solicited vote support door to door, and on election day saw that voters got to the polls even if their babies needed sitting or houses tending. People recognize Hadley as constructive, Mr. Colson said. They know he doesn't support anything he doesn't believe in, and they know he, do he can't be bought. I wish our part of the campaign had been as well organized as his. 
Something worked. Fewer than 1,000 Negroes had voted in the school millage election a few days before the bond election, and more than 6,000 voted in the bond election, upwards of 75% of those in favor of most of the issues involved. So obviously a very stark contrast from 1,000 to 6,000. So it talks about how much power uh, Charles, Charles Hiley had in this community, how much political power he carried, what his word meant, okay? So in this same vein, I'm gonna continue on the same bond issue. So William Colson was talking to some investors. This is in 1974. So I'm gonna read you from this article. He attributed Miami's resurgence to the willingness of community leaders to accept civic assignments in the name of interest of community responsibility and to work with elected officials in carrying out and seeing projects carried out. One of these community leaders, Charles Hadley, was honored at the luncheon with a plaque represented by Knight Newspapers and Miami Herald President Alva H. Chapman Jr., a leader in redevelopment efforts. This community is $120 million richer because of Charles Hadley and those who followed him, said Chapman of Hadley's work in support of the community bond issues. Colson praised what he described as a community determination to preserve waterfront areas for the public. He cited the plans to create a 140-acre pa park on what had been the unsightly old port of Miami, the ugliest front door of any city. When it was, confront when it was confronting cruise passengers, cruise ships now have been removed to the handsome new Dodge Island seaport. So this was actually one of the big discoveries that I made when I was researching this subject because we can literally trace, we can follow the, crumb, the breadcrumbs and we can see Charles Hadley and William Colson's work and we, to the, till this day, enjoy the fruits of their labor. So I'm assuming because I'm very young and I did not know that we had it, that the seaport was originally on the inland of Miami, not on Dodge Island. So when it was moved to Dodge Island, this left this giant patch of land to just, well, obviously they said it themselves it was unsightly. So these block grants, so this block uh, and community redevelopment plans that passed with Hadley's work and Colson's efforts, this literally resulted in what we know as Museum Park, what was called then Museum Park when it was established in 76. That today is known as Maurice Fair Park, and it's where the Perez Art Museum and the Frost Science Museum are located. So, like I said, we can literally thank Charles Hadley for that work and making sure that those redevelopment plans work because now we have those two beautiful museums and this beautiful park on top of what used to be an old port. So that was, this is one of the things that was really exciting for me to discover. I had to do a lot of research into the port of Miami and what was going on with that. So we can thank Charles Hadley for that, which I think was a great, just a great thing. So let me continue here. Uh, he was also instrumental in organizing many of the activities that people enjoyed on holidays in Overtown and Liberty City. So let me read you from this. His noble deeds earned him the name Uncle Charlie. For Thanksgiving celebrations, Hadley contacted grocery stores to secure fixings for Turkey Day dinner. His list of needed families grew annually. The fact that families depended on him was the inspiration to do more. Christmas is the time for toys. Charles Hadley had no shame in contacting stores. He also made arrangements with the police to block off several streets so that we could so that we could roller skate in Liberty City on Christmas afternoon. Easter was the most difficult event to organize and coordinate. His collected thousands of eggs that had to be cooked, dyed, and hidden for the annual Easter egg hunt in Manor Park. Thank you, Oscar, you beat one, but Bicentennial Park. And so let's continue here. So Charles Hadley had achieved quite a bit in his life. And because of this, they had named many buildings in his honor, a library, a park, an elementary school, and an apartment complex. And I, I'm glad that the brains have joined me today because I know that you guys are gonna appreciate this part. So, Charles Hadley had the park dedicated to him, and I'm gonna read you from this newspaper. The city of Miami dedicated a park Sunday to Charles Rudolph Hadley, a man whose political network, Operation Big Vote, had elected members of Congress, state legislatures, mayors, and commissioners. Manor Park at Northwest 50th Street and 13th Avenue became the Charles R. Hadley Park, a ceremony attended by more than 1,500 persons. 
I think it's an important task of government to recognize our friends, to recognize the people who serve the people, said Miami Mayor Maurice Fair. For a person never having been an elected official to command the kind of respect that Charlie does is something to be proud of, said M. Athlete Ranger, former Miami commissioner. U.S. Representative Claude Pepper, the guest speaker, recalled meeting Hadley at a college, as a college student. Hadley had tasted national politics working in Pepper's first campaign. When all of us got elected, it was usually Charles Hadley, Charlie Hadley that triumphs, Pepper said. Hadley called the dedication an honor. I'll never forget it as long as I live. We're going to make this one of the best parks anywhere in Dade County. And he said, if not, I'll be disappointed. That's awesome, Ms. Braden. That's really cool to know. Uh, Hadley's civic work since 1944 had ranged from organizing Easter egg hunts from children at Manor Park to registering voters and lobbying for community concerns. His drive has become such a fundamental fact of life that he frowns when asked to recall how it all began. I do this because of the people, Hadley said. Nobody paid me. The only power we have is the power of the ballot. Why shouldn't I get involved? So that's a, that's a sentiment that I agree with. And it's a powerful one, considering where, what Miami was dealing with, what, what Miami was, what the United States was at the time, that he had so much political power and he was able to exert so much of it over the government. And so the last thing about Manor Park is that Manor Park was actually built where the railroad shop Colored Edition was. So for those who don't know what that was, the Railroad Colored Shop Edition was a neighborhood, a segregated neighborhood, that in 1947, the city of Miami decided to take through eminent domain. They took this land without regard for the people who lived there. They kicked them off without concern for where they were going to go. And it was in one night they moved all these people out and they took that land. And what they developed on top of that, on top of all these homes, was Manor Park and Allapattah Junior High School. And then here in 1982, Manor Park is named in Charles Hadley's honor. So let's continue here. He passed in 1985 due to a stroke and his funeral was attended by many of the people that he helped elect. And I would love to read to you guys from that last newspaper. One of Dade's most powerful vote brokers for nearly three decades, Uncle Charlie Hadley would have enjoyed every second of his 75 minute funeral Tuesday. Legions of those who so often saw his political blessings came one last time to pay their respect. Former Governor Ruben Askew was there. Miami Dolphin owner Joe Robbie was there. Miami Mayor Maurice Fair quoted poetry that elevated Hadley to a mixture of moonlight and steel. Hadley's nephew, Howard Gary, the former city manager whom Fair, fi who her who Fair voted to fire, was in the front pew with Howard's brother, Howard Harold Gary. T. Willard Fair, who led a drive to recall Fair over the firing, pumped hands at the door. Metro Mayor Steve Clark read a proclamation. U.S. Representative Claude Pepper seated next to Hadley's widow, Ella, in the front row of Overtown's Greater Bethel AME Church, closed his remarks with, Shakespeare, with Shakespeare's Hamlet. Good night, sweet prince, and the, and the flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Pepper, 84, also recalled how a U.S. senator he helped get Hadley a scholarship to Florida A&M in the 1930s. Hadley moved to Miami in 1943 and quickly established himself as a man who could organize and deliver votes, a machine that later became known as Operation Big Vote. Pepper called him a community institution, one of the most popular, powerful men in Dade. Every man who sought public office also sought Charles Hadley. So that pretty much covers Charles Hadley. Uh, I'll take any questions that anyone has. We have experts with us too, so that's gonna be excellent. And here's a photo of him. And just as a, a side note, to, to read about him for Ray, thank you, Oscar Drew, for Ray, thank you. Um, he is an inspirational figure because he organized such political power, like to have that much power and to have it in the midst of before, before the civil rights movement, he was putting together this giant block of voters and getting people organized is something to be proud of. And yeah, I agree with Madison. It is very relevant today because in spite of everything that's going on, sometimes feels very negative and feel powerless when confronted with a government that doesn't care about us or 
a police force and that is oppressive. But he organized and he made effectual change. Like I said, because of him, we are enjoying the fruits of his labor. We enjoy the Bicentennial Park, the now known as Maurice Ferre Park, that has a Perez Art Museum and Frost Science Museum. We have all these things that we we enjoy now because of him. And all I know is that if we do nothing, nothing will be achieved. And nothing worth fighting for ever came easy. So we should follow his inspiration and make effectual change in our community too. Uh, thank you, MST2022. Appreciate it. Uh, if I don't have any questions, I, again, would like to remind you that tomorrow we have the virtual field trips with director Timothy Barber. And on Friday night, we have the Lyric Live from the Living Room Edition, which will be hosted by Cello and DJH2. So please join in for that. There's going to be a competition to see who has the best talent, which is always fun. And on Saturday, we have Storytime in Color at 11 a.m. with Camilla Pritchett. And I agree, Javo. A lot of what he went through sounds extremely familiar to what we are facing now. And, you know, just on another note, like, if we don't study our history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? And that is one of the things, like, like I just read to you, 1939, Miami had a Klan rally held here. This is not that long ago. And we still, we have not, I feel that in a lot of ways, not just Miami, but the United States have not come to grips with its own history. His nephew Howard was instrumental in becoming an assistant county manager. And I said, oh my, I didn't know that, Miss Braden. That's excellent. That's really, I'd see. The connections are awesome. So, uh, just to talk about everything that's going on, uh, Keep fighting. This is not going to be over anytime soon. And don't forget about the coronavirus. It's still happening. We have almost reached 110,000 deaths, even though the press has decided to stop covering in light of everything else that's happened. It's still happening. So please stay safe. And thank you guys for joining me again today. I appreciate it. I will be back next week. And thank you so much. Have a good one, everybody.